tonight we're going to begin, <laughs> we're going to begin uh, a brand new sermon series together over the next couple of weeks. As I've been praying and asking the Lord what to share on a prayer meeting on a Wednesday night, the Lord just laid this on my heart and I pray it'll be a great encouragement to you in the weeks to come. And the title of this series that we're going to be going through is called Stories of Revival. Stories of Revival. And we're going to look at some famous revivals in the past. I'm going to explain what a revival is in a moment, but we're going to look at some stories of how God has moved in the past. And my prayer in bringing this and my heart's desire in bringing this is just to stir something within our hearts. I pray that God by His Spirit would awaken something within our hearts here tonight. And I pray that it'll be something that will just, like a little spark, that will begin to take flame and catch flame and spread further throughout our church and throughout the churches in our valley. And so we're going to see what God has done in the past. And I pray it'll be an encouragement for us as we look forward to the future. And tonight we're going to look at uh, a revival that happened in America. It was in the 1800s and it's called the Fulton Street Revival. The Fulton Street Revival. And uh, there's just a verse that God's laid on my heart. And I pray it'll help us tonight as we come to this message. And it's from Matthew 18. Verse 19 to 20, these are the words of Jesus, and I'm sure they're familiar to you, these, when I say them in a moment. Jesus says this, he says, I also tell you this, if two of you agree here on earth concerning anything you ask, my Father in heaven will do it for you. For where two or three gather together as my followers, I am among them. You know, some have defined revival, this, this very popular word within churches, especially in, in our times. But people have defined revival as a community, a church, family, a body of people, a body of followers of Jesus that have been saturated with God. It is an invasion from heaven where God pours out his spirit and awakens his church. I love this definition from this great preacher, this pastor, J.I. Packer. He once said this, he said, Revival is the visitation of God, which brings life to Christians who have been sleeping and restores a deep sense of God's near presence and holiness. Thence springs a vivid sense of sin and a profound exercise of heart in repentance, praise, and love with an evangelistic outflow. Revival isn't for non-Christians. Revival is for the church. Revival speaks of something that was alive but has died. Revival talks about something that has, once was alive, but has died. And you know, when we talk about revival within church life, church history, and within the people of God, we're talking about a people who have, were once alive with God, once passionate about God, once loved God, but have grown cold, have started to go asleep spiritually. But then God, supernaturally, by His Holy Spirit, sparks a flame. Lights a flame, lights that fat passion again within the people of God's heart. If you want a simple definition, revival is a spiritual awakening and how we need that today, how we need that in 2023. You see, when we read the Bible, when we look in the Gospels and when we look in particular in the, the book of Acts, we see how this small group of believers, followers of Jesus, 120 of them, they were, the Holy Spirit was outpoured on them. And they turned the world upside down in the power of God. You know what's amazing is that now today, there are more Christians than ever. There are more followers of Jesus on this planet than ever. But yet, rather than the church turning the world upside down, we're seeing the world turning the church upside down. The church has become a mess. The church has got confused and infiltrated with sin and with the things of this world. We see in the church has become very much like the world. There's no difference. There's no black and white anymore. It's become very gray in that sense. We see there is no difference anymore. Christians who are supposed to be holy and set apart for God, loving God, are no different to the rest of the world. They behave like the world, talk like the world, act like the world. How we need a revival in our time. How we need to see a move of God in our time so that the church would not become like the world, but instead we'd see the world transformed by Jesus moving in and through the church. We need an awakening. There are so many churches, so many Christians who have fallen asleep. It's sad to say, 
But there are many Christians, even within our congregation, who might be spiritually sleeping. I know it's happened in my life on many occasions as well. So I'm not pointing fingers here. It happens to all of us where we lose that passion and that love for God. And so over the next few weeks, we're going to look at some famous revivals. And I pray as we talk about and look at how God has moved in the past, it will cause something to ignite in our hearts. And so we're going to look at tonight, as I said, this, this Fulton Street revival. And this happened, Fulton Street, is in downtown New York. And it happened on the 23rd of September in 1857. So in 1857, it's the 23rd of September, this coming Saturday. So all those years ago, it happened in 1857. Now, America at that time, it was a very tumultuous time for America. It was a a big decline happening in America at that time. It was a period of spiritual decline, political decline, and economic decline. Many people, many followers of Jesus had become very disillusioned and very confused at that time, because there was a a movement of preachers who were predicting that the world would end in 1840. There were preachers, Bible preachers, who were saying that Jesus was going to come back in 1840. And we know from the Bible that nobody knows the hour. Nobody knows when Jesus is going to come again. There are just signs saying, and I believe it could happen soon, but I'm not going to put a time or date on it, because not even Jesus knows. Only the Father in heaven knows when Jesus is going to come. But this teaching... It confused the church. And so it was a mess. The church was in a real mess. There was a lot of political unrest as well because there was a lot of issues with with slavery. There was a threat of civil war in America. And also the history books tell us that in America at that time, there was a financial crisis as well. We are living in a financial crisis at this moment, the economic crisis as well. We see the businesses were going bankrupt. Factories were were closing. Unemployment was on the rise. Banks were failing. It was a real, real mess in America. Does that sound familiar? Doesn't sound like we're far off that, does it? But that's what was happening. But in, in that time, there was a man. And his name was Jeremiah Lamphere. Popular name back then, Dad. (laughs) Jeremy Lamphere. Jeremiah Lamphere. That's his photo up there. And uh, this was a, he wasn't a a pastor in any way, shape, or form. He was just a follower of Jesus. He was a layman, as they say. And he would go sometimes and preach in different churches. And he was asked to go and help in this Dutch Reformed church in Manhattan, in New York. But he wasn't specifically called by God. But you know, he went into this church in in Manhattan, in New York, and he'd been asked to go along there because he was in a real mess. He was really declining. But as he went in there to try and revitalize it, trying to start it again, the church went backwards and members left that place. It went from bad to worse when Jeremiah Lamphere stepped in. But Jeremiah Lamphere decided to take a bold move. He took a bold step. He felt God prompt him to do something. And Jeremiah Lamphere, he rented a building, he rented a hall on Fulton Street in New York, and he rented it so that he could hold prayer meetings there. That's what he decided he would do. That's what he felt like God was laying on his heart to do, was to to start a prayer meeting in this space in Fulton Street, New York. Now, Jeremiah Lamphere, he loved God. He had a passion for God. He was close with God. And he just wanted others to experience that closeness to God that he had. That's all that he wanted to do. Now, he had high hopes when he held this first prayer meeting on the 23rd of September in 1857. He was dreaming and believing God laid his vision in his heart. He was expecting Fulton Street Hall to be absolutely packed out. He had advertised it everywhere. He was opening, hoping for a significant turnout. Do you know how many people turned up for the first prayer meeting? Six people. Six people turned out to this first prayer meeting. Now you'd think, give up, isn't it? You know, the church was declining. He, was, he wasn't doing a great job. You'd think that he would pack it in. But he didn't lose heart. He didn't lose heart after that first meeting. He knew that even with just a few people gathered together, that God's presence would be there and that God could move powerfully. And he held on to this word, which I shared at the beginning of this message, Matthew 18, verse 20. 
For where two or three gather together as my followers, I am there among them. He held on to that and he thought, Lord, I'm going to keep praying. Doesn't matter if there's six of us, we're going to keep praying and believing that you are going to move in mighty ways. Now, he held this prayer meeting, but in America itself, things began to get worse. And people, instead of panicking or, or worrying or looking to drink or looking to drugs or looking to people or whatever for, the, for their help, do you know where they began to turn when things really got worse? They began to turn to God. People began to turn to God. They began to seek God and people began to seek solace in prayer. First week, Jeremiah Lamphere's prayer meeting, six people. By the third week, the prayer meeting had grown to 40 people. It's not even 40 people here tonight. It had grown to 40 people. And they were holding these prayer meetings on a weekly basis. But the people who had gathered, they said, we need God. We need to see God move in our country. We need God's help. We need to turn to God again instead of doing things our own way. And so they decided, we're going to pray not just once a week. We're going to pray daily. We want to meet together and seek God together because times are desperate and we need the help of God. We need to turn from our wickedness and turn to God again. The history books say that on October the 10th, the stock market crashed. And then all of a sudden, more and more people began turning out to these prayer meetings. You know, it said that within six months, there was 10,000 people gathering daily in New York City to pray and call upon God. On lunch times, in their working hours, people were coming out of Wall Street. They were seeking God. There was no answer for them in money. Money couldn't solve their problems. They knew only God could solve their problems. Only God could help them. 10,000 people within six months seeking God. And not only did it happen in New York, God began to move in other places as well. God was pouring out his spirit. And right across America at that time, other prayer meetings began to start and people began to seek the face of God. It's said that in Chicago, in the Metropolitan Theater, it was packed out daily. 2,000 people would meet daily in Chicago to pray and call upon God. It says in Louisville as well, thousands would gather in, morning, in the morning and pray and call upon the Lord. Same in Cleveland and St. Louis and other places. People were gathering daily for months at a time to seek the face of God. Not only were they renting out spaces and churches and halls and all these other places, they were even erecting tents in different places because there were so many people desperate for God. There was a renewed love for God, renewed passion for God, a hunger and a thirst for God. And you know what was amazing about all of this? It wasn't a pastor who had started this. It wasn't just one unique individual, so to speak. It was just an ordinary follower of Jesus. And it was carried and led by ordinary followers of Jesus. Nameless people, but those names are sealed in heaven. Those people will be remembered in heaven and for all of eternity. Just ordinary people, just like you and me, praying and calling upon God. And God in his mercy and in his grace, by his, poured out his spirit and responded to their prayer. And you know, these meetings were filled with preach, a little bit of preaching, but mainly it was just filled with prayer, with songs, with worship, with testimonies. But then they would get back straight on praying. They wanted to call upon God. And we see that from that, there was many move, more moves of God. This third great awakening in America had come to pass all because of praying. And did you know that it wasn't just America that was touched by God, but it had a worldwide impact. It said that this revival spread to Ireland, spread to Scotland, spread to England, spread to Europe, spread to South Africa, India. Australia spread to the Pacific Islands. Do you know where else it spread to? Spread to Wales. Because in 1859, there was a move of God here up in St. David's, up in West Wales. There was a move of God there that, that was a result, many people believe, of that these prayer meetings as well. And during this time, not only was the church ignited, but thousands upon thousands of people give their heart to the Lord. People believed in God, turned to the Lord. Again, people were healed. Backsliders returned to faith. God was moving in powerful ways. And you know, one of the, the best testimonies of it all of this, this incredible revival was that families were restored and families would come together, it said, 
I would re- read the Bibles daily, would pray daily. Children, mothers and fathers would come together in the home and pray and seek the face of God. Entire communities were changed. They weren't living like the world anymore. They weren't drink. There wasn't any of that. They were living for God. They had a passion for God. They realized they need for God. And, and we see there was a great focus on the cross and on the resurrection and on Jesus. That centered on it all. And so we see this incredible ha- revival happened in 1857. Maybe you've never even heard of that revival, the Fulton Street Revival. But God moved in powerful ways. How? Through one guy saying, God, I need you. We need you. We need a mess. Just an ordinary guy. Few people then coming together, praying and calling upon God. And then God responding in powerful ways. And you know, I believe God can do that in our midst as well. Little place, Abraham and small place. Significant name, seismic influence. We've already heard the word of the Lord tonight. I don't need to say anything else. God has already said the time. He's going to pour out his spirit. We're going to get a touch from heaven. We are having experience in a touch of heaven tonight. But you know, my prayer for us as we move forward is that we would keep seeking the face of God together. Prayer precedes revival. If we want to see a move of God, then we need to get desperate for God. And it can happen with just a handful of us. As I said before, a few of us can secure the blessing for the many. And I pray even in this place tonight, that God would awaken us. That's my prayer. I can't speak for what God's going to do in your life tonight. I can't make you pray. I can't make you seek God. But I'm going to ask God tonight, God, awaken me. I need his Holy Spirit to awaken me. I don't know if you need that. Just that fresh fire and infilling of the Holy Ghost, that fresh move of God within our lives. And that happens just when ordinary people humble themselves and say, Lord, we need you. Forgive us. We need you. As it says in 2 Chronicles seven fourteen, if my people will humble themselves, will pray, will seek my face and will turn from my, their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I'll forgive their sin. I'll heal their land. And how our land needs healing tonight. How our homes need healing tonight. How our communities need healing. How maybe we need healing tonight as well. And that comes when we say, sorry, Lord, And God moves by grace and by his spirit.